Hi, this is Jens, and I'm here to tell you that I am so disappointed in the Netflix series. I spent 33 years in prison for a crime I didn't commit, and I had really hoped that Netflix would tell you the truth about my life and what happened back then. But in my opinion, Netflix didn't do that. There's two different kinds of lies. The first one is to spread false claims. The second one is so-called lies of omission. That's when you leave out important facts that you need to know to understand the whole picture. And in my opinion, Netflix did both in this series. I made two videos. In this one, I'm going to be talking about three important false claims at the very end of the Netflix series. But please also look at my other video. That's where I discuss 20. That's right, 20 really important pieces of evidence that are simply left out of the Netflix series. Okay? So, let's start with the first false claim that I think is spread at the end of the Netflix series. At the very end of the Netflix series, there's a strange guy who says that the DNA tests in this case prove neither my guilt nor my innocence. And that's not quite right. First thing you need to know is that this man has no official position in this case. And the second thing is, is that he's not a trained DNA scientist. So this lies outside of his area of expertise. The Virginia Department of Forensic Sciences examined all of the blood samples from the crime scene and they didn't find my DNA anywhere. I've linked up the report below. I'm excluded as a source of all of the DNA at the crime scene. And that's pretty strong evidence that I'm innocent because if, I, if I'd been at the house, they would have found my DNA. And there are two renowned DNA scientists who also looked at the uh, blood evidence in this case. Professor Moses Shanefield, here you see his picture, and Professor Tom McClintock, here you see his picture. He's also in the Netflix series. These two scientists found that the blood at the crime scene came from two unknown perpetrators, not me. They said this in newspaper articles, which I've also linked up below. Check it out yourself. The second allegation at the Netflix series that I regard as factually incorrect is the claim by the so-called forensic pedologist that the sock print at the crime scene was most likely left by me. That's the greatest bunch of BS that I've ever heard in my entire life. Please take a look at the sock print yourself. It's completely smeared. You can't tell anything from this. And then please look at the top. This was obviously left by a foot that was in motion. You can tell the smearing. This was compared with a footprint that was made by carefully placing the foot down on the paper. A foot without motion. You're comparing a footprint without motion to a sock print with motion. That's apples and oranges, folks. That's complete and total nonsense. The next thing is, Footprints and fingerprints have dermal ridges, and you can identify somebody with those. But here we're talking about a sock print. That's like a glove print. There are no dermal ridges. Now, at the very beginning of part four of the Netflix series, they, they show you an interview with Chris Fabricant. He's a national expert on junk science. That's pseudoscientific forensics, and it means that there is no scientific basis for this. He says that you cannot compare sock prints. There's a study from the National Academy of Sciences. They say the same thing. There's a renowned professor at Duke University, Brandon Garrett. He also says this. You cannot compare sock prints. For one thing, and please take a look at this again yourselves, we have no idea what kind of sock covered this foot, how thick the material was, how much fluid it absorbed, I've made a video of this for you, so you can take a look yourself. I compare my hand prints with different glove prints. Check it out. Here I am making three different glove prints with three different kinds of gloves. You can see that each print is different depending on the material used. And now I'm making an ink hand print without a glove, just like I did with my foot back in the 1980s. And now you'll see me doing what the forensic pedologist did. Comparing apples and oranges, a handprint with three different glove prints. You can see that in each case, the hand is smaller than the glove print and the fingers are in different positions, just like the toes were in different positions on the footprints. And now you see little red crosses on all the different prints. This is proof, not proof of guilt, but proof that it's total nonsense. There's one more thing you need to know about sock print LR3. 
In the summer of 1985, before I was arrested, an analyst at the Virginia Department of Forensic Sciences examined the sock print, and he determined that it was a man's size 5 to 6. I've got a size 8 and a half foot. My foot is way too large to have left that sock print. The same analyst also took a look at a footprint from Julian Hasem. That's one of Elizabeth's half-brothers, and the man is completely innocent. But this analyst determined that Julian Hasem could have left that sock print at the crime scene, even though he's innocent. I made a video comparing Julian Hasem's foot to the sock print so you can check this out yourself. It means nothing. Julian Hasem's foot fits LR3 perfectly, yet he's completely innocent, just like I am. A third claim at the end of the Netflix series, which is complete nonsense, is this idea that Elizabeth and I committed the crime together. That did not happen. A lot of police officers have looked at this crime, and none of them believe that Elizabeth and I did it together. Not even the cops that believe I'm guilty think that we both drove to the crime scene together. This is a theory that Netflix invented, and you should ask yourselves why. The theory only works if you believe that Elizabeth and I ordered the room service at 4 p.m., which is what they say in the Netflix series. But that didn't happen. The manager of the Marriott Hotel testified at my trial, and he said that the room service order could only have been put in between 5.30 and 11 p.m. He thinks it was more likely towards 11 p.m. because it was the last order of the day. But in any case, it couldn't have been done before 5.30 because at 5.30, the dinner menu went into effect, and this came off the dinner menu. So, if the order had been put in at 5.30, then the food would have to be prepared, it would have to be delivered to the room, and then somebody would have to sign for it. And then, supposedly, Elizabeth and I would have been driving off to Lynchburg at approximately 6 p.m. Back then, there was still a speed limit of 55 miles an hour, so this would have been a four and a half hour drive. Now, you remember in the Netflix series that they said that the Hastings were expecting us. I actually don't know anything about that, but let's say it's true. Do you really think that the Hastings were expecting us at 10.30 p.m.? And then they opened the door, and we went in together, and we had some alcohol together, and then we ate a little something, and then right around 11 p.m., the murders happened. Do you really think that happened? It did not happen. That is complete nonsense. One of the two of us was in Washington, D.C. and signed for that room service. Now, unfortunately, the room service receipt doesn't exist anymore. The police didn't get hold of it, but it's a fact. You have to sign for room service, so somebody has to be in Washington, D.C., as Yale Feldman said, probably close to 11 p.m. And that is an alibi, folks. After my trial, my attorney spoke with the manager of the movie theater that showed the movie Stranger Than Paradise. And he looked at the tickets and his own records from back then. And he could tell from the tickets, which had serial numbers printed on them sequentially, chronologically, that those tickets must have been sold sometime between 8 p.m. and 10.15 p.m. And that's an alibi, folks. Somebody was at that theater buying tickets between 8 and 10.15. I was that person because those movie tickets were found in my room. I have an alibi. So let's take a step back and ask a question. What problem did Netflix have with this series? The biggest problem was that they had nothing new to say. So they invented something new. This completely stupid and ridiculous theory that Elizabeth and I committed the crime together. But the necessity to put this theory out there forced them to take the sock print evidence seriously and to call the DNA test results into question. Actually, the sock print means nothing, and the DNA test more or less proves my innocence. So, the need to create excitement, interest, buzz, forced them into distorting the truth regarding the sock print and the DNA. And you know what, folks? That's not right. Because I actually did spend 33 years in prison for something I didn't do. And to put this BS out there, just to create buzz, just to sell their product, that's wrong. And I'm never going to forgive Netflix for this.